Some weeks back, I talked to you about Sunday mornings and how much money is spent on Sunday mornings, how much energy and time and focus is put on Sunday mornings, and probably that's the way that it should be when we come to understand that the Sunday morning service that we have is dessert. And so, you know, if you're looking at Sunday morning service as dessert, it ought to be kind of the, the end to everything that's going on, and this is the best part. And some people place all of their emphasis in their nutritional value in church on Sunday mornings. But, you know, I would look at it and say this, you know, that uh, on Sunday morning, maybe 25% of your nutritional value will be met. That's probably over a statement. Probably more like 10% of the nutritional value that you have for a spiritual life, for a healthy spiritual life, is church on Sunday morning. That means that the other 90% or 75% of your nutritional value has to take place apart from here on Sunday morning. Now, through the years, we all have known that there are Christians who come at, on, to church on Thanksgiving and on Christmas and Easter. We, we call those the holiday Christians. And, and then there are those who graduate from there and they get to the place to where they're coming to church every Sunday. And, and we call those Sunday go to meeting Christians. And, and if you get to the Sunday go to meet in Christian phase, you know, you, you have arrived. Because what that looks like then is that you, you're a part of an elite group that gets together on Sundays, and, and that's really a good thing. But how, how do you get from one place to the other place? And is that the end of where God wants us to be in this? Well, what I know is that there are people who have faith and it changes their life. And there are other people who have faith and it doesn't change their life. So is the faith different or what, what is the difference here of a person in their faith relationship and how it changes their life? Well, I've come up with it in this kind of a, a manner. When somebody plants a seed in your life from the word of God, they're, they're planting the seed of possibility in your life. And you go, hmm, yeah, well, I'll, I'll think about that. And then when somebody else comes along and plants another seed of the word in your life, then it becomes a probability. I think probably there might, might, might be something to that. And then somebody else comes along, plants another seed of the word in your life, and it becomes, uh, I'm convinced that this is the way that it is. But a lot of convinced Christians of the truth of God and the way that things ought to be still doesn't change their life. So what happens is the last step of the faith process, and that's where we are convicted. We are convicted that this belief that is in our life is not the way that we are living our life and something needs to change. In the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What I want to talk to you about, somebody recently uh, had a question about the faith in the church. So I, I want to talk to you about the faith. But seriously, where does it all start? Where does the faith start? Where does my faith start? Where does your faith start? It has to start in the Word of God. It is what God said, and, and in the, this is what God said, then we plant seeds in people's lives. And so let's go back to the, uh, the uh, holiday Christian. How did they get to be a, a Sunday go to meeting Christian? Well, because uh, first they, they thought that's possible, I need to be in church. It's probable that I need to be in church. I'm convinced that I need to be in church. I'm convicted that whatever else I am doing on Sunday morning is not nearly as important as being in church on Sunday morning, and so I am going to be in church. That conviction in the faith process leads them to the place that they ought to be. So if I say to you that 10% of the nutritional value of a Christian's walk with God happens on Sunday morning, well, then that means that there's 90% that's got to take place throughout the week. How does, what, how does that happen? Well, do you study your Bible regularly? Do you pray regularly? Are you around Christians regularly? Do you talk about God regularly? You know, I've, I've been around people who, they're, they're just such a pleasure to be around because they're always talking about God. They're always, God's blessing me in such a fashion. If, if you've ever gotten anything from Brett Miller uh, over in Swaziland, whether it's on Facebook or whether he's emailing or texting, uh, it's always going to be, why, wow, we're just so blessed. You know, he has a very small house over there. Dave Naylor went over and saw them, and he said, it's a very nice house, but it's a small house. You know, what Brett got on uh, email, and he said, you know, we have a small house, and that's such a good thing because it doesn't take any time at all to clean it. We've got all this time left over to do something else with, like plant seeds of the Word in somebody's life. 
You know, Kimmy Allen uh, put on Facebook this last week, she put pictures, I think it was a sunset or a sunrise or something like that, and she just said, oh, I'm just so blessed, I'm just so happy. Uh, yeah, you know, people who are talking about God don't realize that they're planting seeds of possibility in somebody else's life, seeds of probability, seeds of convincing, and seeds of conviction. And that's what this looks like. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God then becomes the foundation for the faith. Well, what do we know about the faith in Acts, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 3? It says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. Now, how do you know that somebody's full of faith? Uh, well, that's because we pass out faith tests and you get 100% on it, then we know you're full of faith. No, that's not how that looks like. Evidently, it means that you demonstrate. You know, I, I've heard people say, if you have to tell somebody you're a Christian, you're doing something wrong, I think that is a, a colossal cop-out. Because nowhere in the Scripture does it ever say that we shouldn't tell people that we are Christians. And then to demonstrate by our life that that is a reality in our life, the planting of the seeds, the watering of the seeds into somebody's life is the growth that they need to come to the place of conviction. Well, Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, uh, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them and the word of God spread. Now, you got to see this. When, when people are full of faith and they're living by that faith and they're serving God and they're serving the kingdom, God's blessing comes upon them and the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The faith. The gospel message. The word that comes from God given to us that we now know what God says. This becomes the foundation of the faith and many priests were obedient to the faith because they heard it from somebody they saw it in somebody and they followed after that in them and they became obedient to the faith so what, what we know is it was given to us so that we could become obedient to it obedient to the faith so you know i've asked you before why do you believe what you believe Oftentimes, the belief system is passed down to us from our parents or from the Sunday school teachers we grew up with or, or the youth group leaders who are part of our life. Uh, that's passed along to us. But sooner or later, it's got, be, got to become your faith. And what is the foundation of your faith? Is it what's passed down to you or is it God's word and what God has said? Question, when you look at what you believe and why you believe it, can you look at the Bible and say, the Bible says it, that's why I believe it. Can you say that? Because the foundation of the faith is the word. And we're required to be obedient to it. Well, there's, there's also this thing called a sound faith in the book of Titus, the first chapter, verse 12. It says, one of them, a prophet of their very own, uh, a Cretan, they said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Well, now that's a compliment, don't you think? And, and, and you know, Paul didn't say that to start with, but he did say this, was, this is what was said, and this testimony is true. So, you, you know, he wasn't pointing any fingers, but okay, I'll agree with you. Yep, they're, they're all this way. He goes on, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Well, we know that laziness is not something God approves of. Evil is not something God approves of. Being a liar is something God doesn't approve of. So if that's the way that they are naturally and they come to the Lord, that can't stay as a part of their life. Well, how is it going to change? They've got to be sound in the faith. Well, again, it goes back to that they, they're going to have to view the possibility and they're going to have to look at the probability of it. They're going to have to be convinced it's true and then convicted that they need to change, which means they're going to give themselves over to God that by the power of his Holy Spirit, he can take what is in the word and change their life to match what is in the word. But it's got to be seed planting and understand the purpose and the reason for doing that. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Uh, I can be sound in the faith 
I can be unsound in the faith. How is that? And it goes on to say, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. Well, society has ways of doing things, and society has standards of right and wrong, standards of morality, standards of ethics. Uh, you know, all counselors have to have ethics training every year. It's just a part of their requirement. I don't know if school teachers do too. Uh, they do? Okay. Yep. So ethics training is something that is really important in certain professions. But, you know, those ethics are taught from man's perspective and the way man looks at life, and that's what's important. So what we do oftentimes is we take the ethics we've been trained with, the value system we've been trained with, uh, the, the way that man does things and traditions of man, and we bring them into the church. Not understanding that it's the commandment of men and Jewish fables, yeah, not in our case, not necessarily, but it could be Christian fables that we have learned and been taught. We bring them in and we find, find foundation in them, but we are not sound in the faith until we can look at the Word of God and say, this is how I live my life, and this is the reason why. This is the faith that was given. This is what God says. And if it disagrees with what man says, I must make the choice. And again, it goes back to possibility, probability, convincing, and being convicted that my belief system says I am wrong and I need to change. I give my life to the potter who can work in my life to change me into the belief system that he has for me. In the book of Jude, the third verse, you know, and, and I, I could be ornery and I could say in the third and the fourth chapters of Jude, but uh, you, you, you know there's only one chapter in Jude, so I, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ." Lynette, if we could go back to verse 3, that you contend earnestly for the faith. Well, you know, what do boxers do when they contend for the title? Well, they define, defend it. And what does that look like? Well, they're going to get in there and they're going to duke it out with one another. Uh, and, and so when you're contending for the faith, what does that look like? And, and there are a group of, of Christians today who say, you know, uh, the, the Supreme Court ruling needs to change, and therefore we need to be involved and gather together and charge out there and make them change this. We need to go back to marriage the way it's defined in the Bible, that, that we need to get rid of Planned Parenthood, and we ought to organize a fight against Planned Parenthood because of what they're doing with the sale of fetus parts. That we, we need to get rid of abortion, so let's get out there and let's fight for abortion. And, and, and there's lots of good causes and lots of good fights and obviously, God is against all of those things. And so we ought to get involved in the fight. We ought to contend for the faith. No. Not so much. Matthew 4.19. Now, you thought you were going to get a sermon this summer without Matthew 4.19, didn't you? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Contending the, for the faith has to do with salvation. Now, I need to say this, and, and don't stone me. But we could all get together and we could work on legislation, we could work on laws, we could work on rules, and, and we could get all those passed and in the process not save one person. We could change the law and no one would go to heaven. So follow me and I will make you fishers of men strangely sounds like our chief focus. And by the way, I'm not against people getting involved in the legislative process and, and saying the things that need to be said, and I believe every Christian has a right to vote, an obligation to vote, and to make your voice heard. But the chief focus of our lives should be to be involved in the fishing business, to be planting the seeds of God's Word into people's lives. And when we plant those seeds, you know, I, last week I shared with you that my, my favorite scripture verse, and Charlie Couch badgered me until I finally gave him one, and, and it was really surprising this week, the number of people who came up and said, my favorite scripture verse for the week. That's really cool. I, I think that's just so cool because they're getting into their word and they're, they're seeing what God has given to them, those little nuggets that are in there. And they're, they're, they're using those nuggets as, as a rule in their life and they're sharing it with other people. 
And every time we share it with each other, we're planting seeds of eternity in each other's life. That's what this is all about. The Word of God given to us, and, and we're required to contend for it, well, to contend for its purity and its holiness, and to contend for its purpose, and that is salvation. To be involved in the salvation process of getting involved in other people's lives. Well, uh, we also looked at Ephesians 4, and we've done that a number of times this, this uh, uh, summer, but we're going to do it again. We're going to go back to the 11th verse, and it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If you'd stay there for just a moment, Lynette, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Well, what does that look like? Well, we, we, we have a congregational meeting, and, and we all vote on what we think uh, is important and valuable uh, and, and what we ought to be doing. No, that's not what this is saying. It's saying that when the faith is the rule of my life and the faith is the rule of your life, that will be what unifies us. It is the rule of faith. It is the faith in our lives that makes us unified and united. Now, granted, what he said here is that he's given certain people to the churches because those certain people were needed and certain churches needed those certain people, uh, but all of that fits around the communication of God's word, the building, the foundation of the faith in our life that unites us together. It's not because we agree. It's not because we all like the same things. You know, that's one of the things that the uh, restoration movement has, uh, some nifty little saying, no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. I really like that because what it's talking about is opinion. You know, I've got an opinion and you have an opinion and your opinion is as good as mine. Certainly, that's the way it ought to be. But in the things that God said, that thus saith the Lord, there's no option here because God says this is the way it ought to be. This is the faith. And when we recognize it and we know the word of God, we know the faith that is talked about here, that is what unites us. But unfortunately, not everybody is going to do that because we're all human. And the 20th verse of the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and vain babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Now, I want to think, I want to issue this here for you to think about uh, as we look. Uh, uh, you know, the world says, uh, and churches have bought into this, the, the wor ways, ways of the world, the worldly way of thinking, that, you know, the Bible was written a long time ago in a different society, in a different culture, and doesn't apply to us anymore in this regard. And what they're talking about is same-sex marriage, and what they're talking about is abortion, uh, you know, and, and they go on down the list. Well, uh, that's what's falsely called knowledge. Because it's defined for us, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Be grace with you, amen. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Man does not create the faith. Man cannot influence nor change the faith because the faith is grounded on God and his word, and that is what directs and guides our life. No majority meeting of any group of Christians is ever going to change one piece of the Bible. It is what God has given to us, and when we agree to that, then we can be sound in the faith, we can be obedient to it, it is what unites us, and we can be contending for it and not stray away from it. So how does this all work? Well, you know, we started off at the beginning by looking at, at Christians. you got the holiday Christians. Well, how did they get to be Sunday go to meeting Christians? Well, because they viewed the possibility that maybe they oughta, the probability that probably they should, being convinced that this is really something that you ought to do, but not changing until they came to the place of being convicted. I have watched people over the years, they, they start coming to church and they're sporadic, and then they're a little more regular, then they're a little more regular, and, and then they're there every Sunday, and then they become a part of a care group. And, and then they get involved in ministry. And, and then they're out sharing the word of God with those that they work with. 
and with people who are part of their lives, and, and everybody's looking at them saying, wow, how did they get there? Well, they got there through the faith process. And you and I are in the faith process. There's some things in your life that may be possible that you hadn't thought about, and the first time somebody introduced it into your life, you said, nah, I don't think so, but it was a possibility. And then it was a probability, yeah, yeah, I, I've looked at the Bible, I, I see that that's true, and I, I'm convinced that it really is the truth, and then I'm convicted that because I believe in this, I am convinced that this is true, my life needs to change, I give my life to God. And all of a sudden you find yourself in places that you never would have been before, doing things that you never thought you'd be doing, saying things that you never thought you'd be saying. Why? Well, because the faith is at work in your life. And it has become a conviction in your life that your life needs to change. So why, why do some people have faith and they don't change? Well, because they're stuck in the faith process. They're in the probability, possibility phase. Or, or they're in the convinced it's true, but not enough for, for it to do anything in my life because they haven't been convicted. That because this is their belief, they need to live true to their belief. And so all of us have those things in our life. But I, I want you to see the power of God's word. When you, I want you to think about your own life. How did you become a Christian? Was it not because somebody spoke into your life? Was it not because somebody shared the word of God with you? They planted seeds in your life? And every time we do that, every time we talk about God, every time we talk about how blessed we are and, and viewing God's handiwork and God's creation, and she's always putting some nonsense on there about her little girls and what a treasure they are from God. You, you know, anybody ever wonder where Kimmy Allen's at in her walk with God? She tells you on Facebook. Am I telling people in my life about why I am the way I am? Steve ha has people say, I want to be like you. And Steve shares with them the reason Steve is the way he is is because of his relationship and walk with God. You see, we're all planting seeds of faith in each other's life. And the faith seeds that we're planting are a part of the faith, which is capable of changing us and molding us and shaping us into what God wants us to be. Question. You believe. What do you believe? And from where do you believe it? The traditions of man or the word of God? Pray for me, please. I thank you, God, that you've given us plenty of examples of the things that are taking place around us and in us. And even though we may not understand the process of today, we don't have to because you're the potter, we are the clay. What you're asking of us is just surrender. So, Lord, I'm praying this day that your spirit work in my life and the lives of people who are here, that all of us would see that you're at work and you're using people in our life to plant those seeds, and those seeds are going to grow, not because we've decided, but because you have decided. And as they grow, we will come to the place of change and be molded and shaped into vessels of honor. Lord, I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.